You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. Good morning, I'm Prashant. With me, my colleague Sonia and Reema. Guys, hi. Hi. Uh, I have to warn the viewers that don't. we're not trying to tell you anything in terms of what the market should do with the colors that... <laughs> <laughs> we're dressed know, to Christmas <laughs> and we're not dressed to tell you what the market mood is, though it is very bearish. It is a bit bad, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't help but feel festive. I mean, it's Christmas it Eve feeling, tomorrow. <laughs> it is. The bulls, the bulls and the bears are on leave, guys. So, you know, no one's really <laughs> feeling this market anymore. I think, the you know, all all the feelings are going to come out from the first. We of have January. to believe that people are watching, Sonia. Yeah. <laughs> Carry on. Okay, let us quickly uh, tell you the uh, action in terms of how things are set up. So, what do we have, right? I mean, uh, and I want to start with uh, just an extension of what I put out right at the word go the, uh, yesterday morning, which is Nifty moves. Uh, the volatility continues, uh, and this is the sixth session where we've seen. For six days now, we've basically had an average of 200 point intraday moves, and yesterday was no different. Uh, so, you know, you can see yesterday, day before yesterday, a big sell-off from the day highs. The pre, the two, two days prior to that, a big pullback, 200-point pullback from the day's low. So this is uh, extremely volatile. I could further dissect this with all the moves intraday that we saw, and that amounted to some 600 points, 650 points on the Nifty. But I'll spare you the details. In any case, I think we can agree that it's been extremely tough uh, to kind of uh, trade the market, especially if you're trading very near term. It's been completely uh, very, very difficult. Overnight queues, uh, so Wednesday we saw out of the US a decent rally, but that was completely wiped off. So this is the change last night, S&P 500. By the way, this is good news because I mean, you know, S&P was down 3% at one point, NASDAQ was down 4%. So losses were cut in half by the time the US market session ended. Uh, US indices uh, on your screen, jobless claims and GDP numbers both beat expectations. Uh, now this is the kind of confusing market we are in. We had, remember, on uh, the previous day, on Wednesday session in the US, we had the consumer confidence numbers, right, which came in stronger than expected. And the market decided to cheer that. Yesterday, you have uh, more stronger data, two more uh, numbers, and the market decided to sulk. Uh, I think it's just basically uncertainty about how much more there is to go in this current cycle. I mean, you know, it's in a bit of a state of flux. So yesterday's data, in a way, validating Fed's uh, view that U.S. economy is strong enough to take more punches, take more tightening, withstand more tightening. And I think that was the wisdom which prevailed uh, yesterday. Tesla, by the way, was is one name which sold off 10%. We'll talk more about that. You know, I call it, not it's not just Tesla, it's talismanic Tesla. It's got properties, it's got, it's got uh, other properties which normal stocks don't have. And we can talk more about that. I mean, it draws retail investors in a cultish-like behavior, uh, which no other name does. No other tech name, not Apple, nothing else does. Tesla was down 10. We, uh, as I said, we'll talk more about that. Uh, in the, on the Nifty here, uh, so, you know, we yesterday, we put, uh, put this number out yesterday morning. The number exactly is not 18,100. It's about 18,080 uh, 18, or so. But let's round it off. 18,100 is a support. The market yesterday bounced exactly off those levels. Uh, and I'll put a graph out which tells you that. But on the bank nifty, yesterday's low, which is 42,231, is the first support, really, uh, which uh, one needs to watch out for. I think one thing is very, very clear. It's been absolutely futile to chase the moves straight up. You know, from extremes, the market has turned, either on the way down or the way up. The graph, the nifty graph, will make that point even better. Uh, this is something which we put out yesterday in the uh, afternoon closing bell as well. Uh, so that's a trend line drawn from the lows of June uh, 17th. That was absolute low on the Nifty. Then it's got a second touch point on the 30th of September. And yesterday, we got a bounce exactly of that level. Actually, to be uh, very, very technical, we saw a break of that for a, a few, I think, half an hour or so. And then the market bounced off that particular level. And that is about 18,100. A little lower than that, but let's uh, say 18,100 roughly is, where, is what the market needs to hold. The SGX will come up on your screen, and I think SGX at least is indicating we will start around that 18,100 level, maybe slightly below that, around yesterday's low, 18,090. That's about 90 points lower. Sonia, hi, Rima. Hi, hi morning. Hi. So it's an ugly start, right? As someone on Wall Street was putting it, uh, Santa Claus perhaps lost his way a little <laughs> bit. Uh, and it, it is the law of averages as well. I mean, in 2020 and 2021, you had a Santa Claus rally in the US, and this yeah. time perhaps uh, it's not playing out. But having said that, uh, it's a sell-off that has resumed globally. So not just in the US markets, but even across Asia. Uh, Japan saw its core inflation hit the highest level in 40 years overnight. 
and the Nikkei market as we speak is down almost about 300 odd points so keep that in mind. Brent crude is back below $81 a barrel. There are of course rate hike fears once again uh, so that's another data point. But in India very interestingly both foreign and domestic investors bought in the cash markets yesterday and there was a large buy figure from domestic investors over 2200 crores. Uh, so let's see if that provides any kind of support to the market over 900 crores of buying from FIs as well. Now a couple of levels that I'm watching in addition to what uh, you know Prashant just spoke about the 50 day moving average was breached on the downside yesterday 18,166 so does that open uh, doors for a further downside in the market the nifty remember is down three and a half percent in December already the nifty IT index is down six percent and we head into IT earnings as well so keep an eye out on these pockets and a lot of these gainers of the year uh, you know whether it's an Axis Bank uh, something like a Tata Motors, Ambuja Cements all seen long unwinding yesterday so I'll keep my eye out on that. There are two interesting uh, pieces of news in the IPO market as well. Uh, there's the landmark cars listing that takes place today. It was subscribed over three times. Let's see how that shapes up. And there's also an IPO that opens today called Radiant Cash Management. It's an integrated cash logistics player. So I'll watch out for that as well. But all in all, looks like it's going to be a rather ugly start to trade. Absolutely. The SGX Nifty right now is down half a percent, so lower by 80 points. That said, uh, the sell-off that we're seeing in the SGX Nifty is not as bad as what we're seeing across the rest of the Asian markets, where the cuts are deeper, down 1 to 1.5%. 1 the Korean market, Kospi down 1.6%, Taiwanese markets down 1.3%, and you can see the Japanese markets down 1% as well. The question is, did the Indian markets preempt part of the sell-off at least yesterday? Because yesterday, the Indian markets closed in the red despite a positive buys in the global indices. And while the damage on the benchmark indices, the Nifty and the Sensex, was not very deep, the benchmark indices were down 0.3-0.4%, you did see a fair amount of selling in the broader markets. Look at the advanced decline ratio yesterday at 1 is to 6. Nearly 2,500 stocks ended in the red. So there was a fair amount of meltdown that we saw in the broader markets. Uh, just to underscore the point that Prashant was making, yesterday's low of 18,070 18070 will be very crucial because it coincides with a 38.2% retracement of the recent up move from 16750 to the all time high levels of 18888. So, right, so these two indicators coincide. So, 18,070 will be very crucial. Meanwhile, you know, you spoke about buying seen uh, by the DIIs in the cash market and the FIs. Look at the way, look at the kind of buying that we saw in the Agenda Pharma block, right? Yeah. So many of these uh, marquee uh, DIIs, uh, MFs have bought and maybe that partly explains the uh, DII buying because a lot of uh, MFs, uh, mutual funds were buyers in the Ajanta Pharma block deal yesterday. By the way, in the futures and options space, the FIs have been steadily unwinding their long positions. On 1st of December, the FI longs on the index were closer to 76%. For the last three days, it's below 50% and yesterday it came down to 46-47%. The short positions consequently have been um, you know, going up. So broadly, the market mood continues to remain somber. The Indian markets have remained under pressure this month. Barring some intermittent rebounds, the Nifty has fallen close to about 4% from its all-time high levels that we hit on 1st of December of 18,888. That's the positioning. Okay, well, uh, we start off with uh, an ugly day of trade, but guess what? It's the last day before most people go off for their Christmas and New Year holidays. So there's definitely a lot of festive cheer on the street. Let's see if that can translate into gains on the equity markets as well. First up, we have a comment coming in from Gautam Dugad of Motilal Oswal Financial Services who says that markets will see higher volatility now due to recent COVID concerns and government's increased caution. He says there is no room for re-rating on valuations and market could see consolidation in a range. He says no major sell-off is expected either uh, because India is well supported with strong fundamentals and he would look to buy tech stocks and financial names, Axis Bank, ICICI Bank, SBI, Infosys and TCS on a dip. And he's also looking to buy rural consumption stocks like HUL and m, &M. He's expecting the rural economy to see a recovery in the next few months. Okay, some money market views now. This is Bhaskar Panda of HDFC Bank who says that resilience seen through recent US data has brought back fears of higher rates for longer as far as US goes. He says the dollar index gained and oil remained a little elevated, which means Asia, ex-Japan currencies will be under pressure today. Given this backdrop, background, he expects the dollar INR fair to trade in a range of between 82.75 to 82.95 to a dollar for the day. On the bonds, Bhaskar Panda says RBI MPC minutes show that members continue to be concerned about inflation. 
Hence, policy tightening is going to stay and benchmark yields have moved up a bit because of that. He expects the 10-year benchmark bond deal to trade in a range of 7.3 to 7.35% for the day. Okay, uh, well, uh, Jahangir Raziz, Head of Emerging Markets, Economics, Research and Commodities at JP Morgan is now joining us. Uh, uh, Jahangir, great to have you with us here. You know, markets latch on to reasons or at least uh, we force reasons on, on to price action. Uh, but, uh, you know, Wednesday you had the co uh, consumer conference numbers which were strong, markets were strong. Yesterday we had uh, jobless claims out of the US, GDP numbers which were strong, markets sort of. I mean, it, it just uh, confusing kind of uh, price action overall on the equity side, but what are you making of all of the data that we're getting out of the US? Look, I mean, we have to acknowledge that we are in a very bizarre world where good is bad and bad is good. Um, so I think, you know, if you look at the, uh, you know, what drove the market down today, it was the revision in the third quarter GDP in the U.S. and the fact that the, you know, for, for first time claims were not as high as people had thought. And I think that goes to show you that, you know, that, you know, the market had probably brought into the idea that the Fed was probably, you know, close to being done. Uh, but clearly, uh, this is to move, moves towards what the Fed has been telling us uh, in, you know, in, in FOMC meeting after FOMC, that they are not close to done, even though they have downshifted. And I think that's basically what is driving the market uh, at this point in time. And I would say that, you know, along with what the uncertainty around, uh, around Fed even though the Fed has been very clear about where they want to take uh, the, the, the terminal rate to. Uh, in addition to that, you know, the uncertainty around the reopening of China. And I would say that, you know, uh, you know the coming disinflation uh, that people are preparing for in the, in the next two, three months, I think those are the three things that are driving markets. And it's very hard to sort of figure out what is going to dominate one over the other. Mm. Jangir, uh, good morning and greetings of the season to you. It's not a very chirpy mood here on the Lal Street, but nevertheless, people are, I guess, you know, in festive mood as we head into the end of the year. But uh, in the new year, from an Indian market standpoint or from an economy standpoint, what are the top two or yeah. three things that you would watch? Uh, the standard question, of course, is how many more rate hikes. But what do you think the larger, uh, you know, overarching theme will be? So I think I think what has been confusing me, and you know, is the fact that you know, let's say the government's uh, you know 2022 to 23 growth forecast is seven percent. Uh, if if we just take that, then the government itself is saying that in the next six months uh, the economy is going to slow to about four and a half to five percent. That's just pure arithmetic. You had a 13, 13 and a half percent first quarter of the fiscal year. You had a six point three percent in the second quarter. So if you're going to have a 7% average, you have to slow down to 4.5%, 5% for the next six months. And then both the consensus and parts of the government are talking about 6 7% growth rate in 2023-24, which means that they are expecting you know, a 4.5%, 5% economy over the last six months of the fiscal year to jump by another 200 basis points in a world where all of us agree, depending upon you know, what the numbers are, but, you know, let's set that aside. All of us agree that the global economy is going to slow down. And I think that sort of is the one that's confusing me in terms of where where the market in India is looking at these numbers and where they're looking for I, I, and where they're heading. And I think this, this idea that India can add about 200 basis points in growth rate uh, when the global economy is going to slow down from, let's say, 3 to 1.6, 1.7, I think that's going to be very, very challenging. Mm. Okay, uh, that point is uh, well taken. Uh, Jahangir, investors in India are also latching on to the belief that there is commodity disinflation and that's going to help earnings growth in 2023. Yeah. Do you think there is a risk to that, that commodity disinflation may not play out to the extent that the markets and investors are anticipating? So again, in the commodity space, I think much of it depends upon what is going to be the pace and the manner in which China reopens. So we have a view that, you know, in the first half of next year, China is probably going to struggle uh, to generate any positive growth. And in the second half of the year, 
once they able to acquire some form of natural immunity of about 35, 40% of the population, and that's a very tall task. Uh, once that happens, you are going to see China reopen and China growth actually pick up very strongly. And I think that's the time when you are going to see materials prices, industrial metals prices actually move up. My guess is that the market is trying to bring that forward. On the oil side, on the energy side, I think much of it depends upon supply. And on the supply side, I think there are two really drivers of what is going to drive uh, oil prices in the next six to seven months is to what extent the U.S. continues to replenish its uh, it, it reserve stocks. That's one thing. And the other is, you know, how does OPEC react to uh, the decline in prices? I mean, if OPEC goes and cuts another half a billion million barrels a day or something like that, I think they're going to boost up prices. So I think much of it depends upon the supply responses uh, or rather responses from OPEC plus as well as, you know, what exactly is the U.S. going to do with this SPR? <clears throat> right. Uh, Jangir, here in India, do you, again, I mean, uh, the belief is that we are closer to a peak in terms of rates, interest rates, uh, maybe another 25 basis points. Uh, what's your yep. opinion? We have that same view, hmm. uh, that another 25 basis points and probably is done. But I would say that the monetary policy uh, minutes, I think, would probably lead to people starting believing that the rate hikes are not done. I think the fact that both the governor and parts of the monetary policy com uh, com policy committee actually said uh, and were concerned about premature pausing um, basically says that they are not really seeing it the way in which the market is seeing it or we are seeing it. Uh, my sense is that that is actually a good thing. The premature pausing actually could lead to serious financial instability, uh, you know, opening up sometime in, in next year. Uh, so, on one hand, I'm actually pleased that the governor and parts of the FOMC did talk about, you know, the dangers of premature pausing, but that of obviously push, pushes our own call into concern, into this thing because we actually did, did expect another 25 basis points and then pause. Okay, but do you think that the RBI policymakers would want to see a decisive inflation decline before making any change in their policy stance? Because the narrative is that inflation is expected to be quite sticky around 5% through the course of FY24. That's correct. I would say that much more than the pace of disinflation, more or less we all know that core inflation is going to get very sticky, right? I think much more than what happens to Indian inflation, I think what happens to global financial conditions is what is going to drive uh, uh, RBI policy. That's my sense. That, look, you know, you, you are going to see the Fed continuing to raise rates, and let's say by the end of first quarter of next year, they're probably going to pause somewhere slightly above 5% uh, or 525 5 uh, By that time, you know, most likely you are going to see the end of dollar strength, uh, at the same time, in the next three months, you're going to see some very spectacular disinflation taking place in emerging markets. India is not going to be one of those countries, or Asia is not going to be one of those countries because inflation wasn't very high. And markets are going to start pricing in, in most of emerging markets, significant rate cuts. I think that is where I think the concern is. And if, if, the, fair, if, the, if, the, if the RBI follows that, and, you know, pauses prematurely, I think there is a serious concern that they could open up, you know, you know, you know, a, 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 a point where, you know, financial instability, particularly pressures on the rupee, can re-emerge and re-emerge much more strongly. Uh, right. yeah. Sorry. Uh, Jahangir, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And season's greetings to you. A very Merry Christmas from everyone at CNBC TV 18. Get into a quick break. Our list of top 10 stocks is lined up next. Welcome back. Last day of the week, the penultimate week of 2022 as well. And the SGX Nifty this morning is down 100 points. But let's drill it down to individual stocks. Our research team is standing by with CNBC TV 18's list of top 10 stocks of the day. 
So, dear, starting with you, SBI cards. First, I can't take my eye off all the red on the screen, right? <laughs> I mean, all the girls in bright red and sell. Actually, even Vivek is wearing a, a red, red tie. tie. So, everyone's in Christmas cheer. Merry Christmas to all of you in advance. Uh, you know, SBI card is in focus today, and I'm going with green over there because it's market share gains that SBI card has seen after reporting a record credit card addition. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the numbers, uh, the number of credit cards that they've added uh, is 3.88 lakhs in November versus a past 12-month average of 2 lakhs and 3.4 lakhs in October. So, November was a very strong month for them in terms of credit card addition. Now, their market share has also gone up. It's a small rise, but it's been inching up month after month. And now, SBI card enjoys almost 19.5% of the market, which is a gain of 17 basis points month on month. Uh, Morgan Stanley put out a note where they have um, an overweight call with a target price of 1100, which is a big upside to the current market price. And they say that uh, the, the, the biggest USP of SBI card is they continue to gain market share and uh, the spends market share has also improved so not only have they added more people in terms of you know issuing credit cards but the credit card spend per person has also marginally improved month on month to 18.3 percent so i'm going with green for sbi card today let's uh, also get to vahishta and she's going to be telling us the latest on defense procurement the news and the impact on individual names vahishta Hi, Reema. Good morning. All the defence talks are expected to be in focus today and this is because the Defence Acquisition Council has given the approval for 24 capital acquisition proposals and the proposals are worth approximately 84,000 crores. Now, these include six for the Indian Army, six for Indian Air Force, ten for the Indian Navy and two for the Indian Coast Guard. Now, 21 of them, which is worth approximately 82,000 crores, are approved for the procurement from indigenous sources. And this is to equip the Indian Army with combat vehicles, with light tanks and mountain uh, gun systems. So st stocks such as Bharat Electronics, Bharat Dynamics um, and Hindustan Aeronautics are expected to be in focus today. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, Pharma stocks also on our radar this morning. Ekta is here to give us the lowdown. Ekta, over to you. Thanks for that. Well, I'll start with Suven Pharma. There's an ET report that Advent has emerged as the front runner to buy Suven Pharma. Promoters own 60%. Advent is negotiating to buy almost 51% for around 6,000 odd crores. And they're looking to launch an open offer for an additional 26%. CNBC TV18 has not verified this particular report independently, but Nisha Podar has been reporting. Uh, all the way back since I think around 2020 about Suven's uh, intention to sell stake and the company is in talks with PE firm's strategic players for this particular stake sale. Ajanta Pharma, non-executive promoters have sold that 4.38% stake that Vivek was alluding to yesterday. They're looking to utilize the funds for financing their private business plus repayment of loans taken against pledge shares. Lupin would be in focus because they're recalling four lots of a particular hypertension drug due to the presence of a particular, uh, particular uh, ingredient which could increase the risk of cancer. They have stopped manufacturing this drug since September 2022. Expect it to be a sentiment negative because the USFT had come out with a statement yesterday, um, you know, during market hours. So there's a likelihood that Lupin could have already factored this news in. All right, uh, Ita, thanks very much uh, for that. Now, more stocks with news flow. Vivek is here with that list. Vivek, hi, good morning. Well, good morning. You know, quite a few stocks on our radar. Uh, first up, uh, Welshman Enterprises. Now, this is the consummation of a deal that the company had earlier announced in June 2022. The company has gone ahead and completed the divestment of six road assets to act as Highway Infra Limited. So, what has happened? The company has got uh, the nod from the NHAI, the Public Works Department, as well as all of the lenders for this particular asset divestment. Uh, uh, what are the road assets? Uh, five HAM projects, hybrid annuity uh, model projects of 100% complete divestment over there. And as far as uh, the BOT toll asset project is concerned, a 49% stake divestment the company has got the nod for, awaiting the nod for the further 51% stake. Cumulative enterprise value for this particular transaction is a little over 5,800 crores. Next talk on our radar, Ingersoll Rand. Some significant capacity addition uh, being taken by the company. 170 crores uh, to be spent uh, on CAPEX. This is going to, mainly going to be funded via internal accruals. So, a monthly capacity of the company will increase to almost 50%. And the company is targeting uh, both you know, enhancement of existing capacity, uh, manufacturing capacity, as well as uh, looks to target the export market. Lastly, Railtel Info. The company has got an order of almost 100 crore rupees and this is particular work orders from Wibble Technologies and this is mainly for the data center business in West Bengal. 
All right, thanks a lot for that. Well, uh, let's do a quick recap in case you missed out on any of the stocks. Stocks with positive news flow, there's SBI Card, BEL, Bharat Dynamics, HAL, Suvan Pharma, Ajanta Pharma, Ingersoll Rand, Realtel Corp and Wellspun Enterprises. Well, the only stock with negative news flow today is Lupin. So let's see how it shapes up for the day. Let's get to commodities then. Manisha Gupta joins in for a roundup of all the action from the world of commodities. Hi, Manisha. Good morning. Morning and thank you for that. Well, I'll start with the energy markets where we did see the crude oil prices fall by a percentage point in the New York session. It's up 1% in the Asian markets right now. So uh, it is looking at a huge amount of volatility right now and expected so as we head towards the holidays right now. But the point being that $82 around about is holding and the markets are looking at strong demand, especially from U.S. as the holiday season begins there, as well as the winter demand is supportive too. It is the natural gas prices which have continued to decline. The U.S. natural gas trade at a nine-month low, and the European Union natural gas prices now trading at a six-month low. In the Asian markets right now, there's a bit of a gain, but for the week, we're down by nearly 20 to 30 percent for gas varieties across board. Markets are reacting to the strong U.S. GDP numbers and the strength in U.S. dollar as well. So uh, the expectation being that we are perhaps looking at a range anywhere between 75 to 82 before we end this year for crude prices. Okay, all right, Manisha, thanks uh, very much for that. We'll take a quick break here. We'll come back. Anand Tandon will be with us for some fundamental stock analysis. Later, we will connect with N. Kamakodi of City Union Bank to talk about the bank's gross NPA divergence of 259 crores. The stock reacted quite uh, sort of uh, in a powerful way on the downside earlier when the news came. So that conversation will be interesting as well. Stay with us. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. It is the last day of the week and guess what? It is the week before Christmas and New Year. So we have Anand Tandon, market expert, joining us now uh, to talk about, of course, the year gone by and what to expect from the new one. Anand, welcome to the show. Merry Christmas to you in advance. Uh, it's not a very Merry Christmas for the bulls, you'd have to say. But do you think there's a steep sell-off coming or do you think that India will continue to perhaps, you know, exhibit the kind of resilience that it has been doing in the year gone by? The market overall has been uh, quite resilient, uh, you know, and even in other markets, I would argue that other than tech in the U.S., where one has seen a very substantial correction, the index per se has not done that badly compared to the kind of interest rate hikes one has seen. In India, I think the, uh, you know, you could make an argument both ways. One, the positive argument today that is being made is that, you know, the U.S. inflation has peaked out interest rate differentials will not increase, uh, will not uh, add up from here. And consequently, you know, you will find more money going into emerging markets. And in that sense, India will continue to now have an inflow. Uh, there is, uh, however, an equivalent uh, argument that can be made on the other side that uh, if you ex assume that China opens up, oil goes up, consequently, there is greater economic activity than earlier presumed, then the commodity prices that we've been seeing falling so far may not, and therefore inflation will continue to remain higher for longer. And in, in that context, you know, given the fact that India is not particularly cheap relative to some of the other markets, uh, if there are any inflows, it may not be enough to take the market significantly higher. So in both cases, as you see, the, uh, the upside is not very high, but right now the downside doesn't seem to be very scary either. Uh, usually, market doesn't stay in this kind of equilibrium, so you will find a breakout one way or the other. My own suspicion is that, you know, in a month down the road, we'll be looking at the budget, and there can be some uh, scarier factors coming in from the market in terms of capital gains, etc. So I would still remain somewhat, uh, uh, you know, uh, easy in terms of increasing equity allocations at this stage. Okay. okay. All right. Now, uh, take that point, uh, uh, Anand. Anand, hi. Good morning. You know, <clears throat> let's talk about individual uh, pockets, uh, really. PSU banks, uh, uh, you know, had a frenzied move, and uh, they're uh, down about 12. The, in, the PSU bank index is down some 12% now from last Tuesday's high. Uh, your sense on whether this is just a pullback and there is more to go here? Uh, because, you know, we've seen this, right? I mean, after such a large move, uh, they, sometimes there's a significant pullback, and then, uh, you know, uh, once again, the move uh, starts. Is that the likely scenario here, or you think it's done? 
Well, I don't think it's done. I think banking is one space which will continue to do well, corporate-facing banks in particular. And PSUs typically tend to have a better portfolio for corporate lending than they have for, uh, for retail. So as a consequence, they were providing a fairly undervalued uh, part of, this, uh, of the market. I think that correction is more or less done. From here on, what you're looking for is the growth that you're going to continue to get in the portfolio. So it now has become an equal balance between being able to set up, um, give out more credit, but at the same time, raise more liabilities. And that is where I think you know the private sector banks uh, benefit quite hugely. So to the extent those banks which have the ability to increase their deposits uh, will probably continue to uh, do quite well. So the larger public sector banks, I think, are uh, the ones that one would be looking at. And at this stage, I would argue that even though the private sector banks are more expensive, the relative valuation gap has come down quite significantly, and especially the frontline companies. And consequently, you may want to start re-looking at those because clearly as the uh, rates increase, the increase in uh, deposits is more likely to go to the incremental increase in deposits, more likely to go to the private sector banks. And therefore, they will be able to manage their NIAs, I think, a little better. Uh, Anand, uh, morning. Globally, the COVID scare is back. As of now, the advice is that things may not be as bad as what's happening globally in US, China, in India. Uh, but do you think one should be ahead of the curve and perhaps start looking at some pharma diagnostic names? Because who knows, right, what happens six months down the line? Is that a play that you would look at tactically? Rima, I don't think it's possible to play that uh, scenario really in the sense of uh, you know trying to predict what happens to COVID. We have to really let it happen and see how we react to it. So it will essentially have to be back-ended. That said, uh, you know, your question about whether one should be investing in healthcare and pharma, I think absolutely. That's been one sector that has underperformed the market quite considerably for quite some period of time now. So while hospitals in general have done reasonably well, pharma hasn't. So over the last two, three years, that's been a bit of a, a dog in, in terms of performance. So if you look at the next three years outlook, I'm reasonably sure you'll get one uh, round on the way up. And therefore, this may be a good time to be getting in. You know, uh, Anand, we request you to stay on because we have the management of City Union Bank now joining us, uh, the first corporate on the show. Uh, now, uh, Mr. N. Kamu Godi is managing director and CEO of City Union Bank. What has happened is that uh, there is a, a City Union Bank filed an exchange uh, notice. They said that there is about 259 crores of uh, gross NPA divergence. This is pertaining to F522, which was found uh, as per the RBI inspection. There's 259 odd crores. This is about... 20% of the reported slippage number. Mr. Kamkodi, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. The question uh, which we want to know is, out of this 259 odd crores, how much has already been uh, kind of uh, uh, recognized, uh, addressed, and how much is remaining and how much is likely to slip, in your opinion? See, as you uh, uh, rightly said, uh, the uh, NPA numbers, uh, uh, gross NPA numbers, which were uh, declared by us uh, on 31st March 2000. 22 was uh, 1,933 crore and assessed by RBI was uh, 2,192 crore, making a divergence of uh, 259 crore. Out of that, about, uh, like say, uh, 25 percentage already, like say, for example, about uh, 64 crore uh, have been either already, uh, like say, recognized or, uh, like say, accounts have been uh, closed. Uh, we have another uh, about uh, uh, 20 to 25 percentage, which we feel the, uh, like basically the uh, NPA marking had been for some technical reasons where the businesses have been uh, uh, performing and we, uh, as per our judgment, they have, uh, uh, like for more for a technical reason, they will be able to perform and get upgraded over a period of time, leaving about, uh, uh, like say, uh, um, uh, 50 to 60 percentage of them, like say, where we have to go for the uh, recovery thing. Basically, uh, the you might have also seen in the filing, uh, like say, the regulatory tolerance Mr. Limit, uh, for disclosure. Mr. Kamgodi, uh, Mr. Kamgodi, sorry. Mr. Kamgodi, sorry. Yeah, just one yeah. minute. Just a minute, just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, tolerance, regulatory tolerance limit for disclosure was 190 odd crore, and it, uh, our uh, uh, thing exceeded by about 70 crore, for which the incremental provisioning needed is about 40 crore. We saw this the last year profit of about 70 crore. We hope uh, the, we have sufficient. Uh, strength to uh, absorb that and provide and move on. Okay. No, uh, so you said uh, about 64, 65 crores out of 260 crores has, has been addressed. Another yeah. amount of this equal value is likely to be uh, sort of uh, addressed, right? I mean, you're... Yes. Uh, right? So that's a, that's a total of 130 crores. And the rest yeah. of the 130 crores, 
you'll have to provide yes. you'll have to provide for yeah we have to go for the recovery procedure yeah no so yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah and the basically you, you might have seen mm. Our, uh, uh, so, so, like so your, assess from your assessment of the slippage number is about 130, 135 crores, right? See, basically, that is where we have to go for recovery thing. And our capacity, uh, as per uh, depending upon the collateral available and all, for every 100 crore slippage, we recover about 20 to 80 crore. Mm -hmm. uh, balance, uh, we may have to take the credit line. Okay, so 25% of the divergence at 64 crores recognized, another 65 crores likely to be recognized going forward and you'll have to go for a recovery procedure of 130 crores, got sorry, that? No, no, uh, no, yes. it's, uh, it's other way, it's other way, okay. uh, uh, like uh, 65 crore had been already uh, done and another 65 crore over a period of time they will be getting upgraded okay. and the balance uh, 100, 120 crore we have to recognize. And you said okay. uh, towards the end you said about uh, based on your past recovery efforts, uh, credit loss, final credit loss could be 25 to 30 crores. So 25 to 30 percentage or 25 to 30 figure, roughly they match, yes. Okay. Oh. Can you tell us what led to this divergence? And generally, 15% divergence doesn't require a disclosure. So what led yes. to both the divergence and the disclosure this time? See, uh, as, as you said, the uh, our uh, uh, divergence uh, uh, overstepped the tolerance limit by about 70 crore. Basically, the uh, now after the automation of uh, uh, NPA and all, now the, the 90 day norms, uh, like wherever the this delay is because of the repayment uh, beyond 90 days is automatically captured by the uh, like uh, the system. And these 250 crore are uh, basically by like say uh, something uh, beyond that on technical grounds, be it names of like uh, how the repayment had come, how, whether the restructuring, uh, whatever we had done, the assumptions have been right and all. Basically, you get the more uh, information at this point of time. Normally, like, uh, how the process works is, uh, the system determines the NPA, then you have an internal audit process, then you have uh, statutory branch audits, and then you have statutory central audits. And you will uh, have some gray area where, uh, like the, the uh, 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 whether they are falling this side of the line or that side of the line. And we had a similar uh, issue about six years back in 2000, uh, like the 16, when we had a similar uh, uh, divergence of about uh, uh, 82 crore had to be made and uh, for six years uh, there was no uh, divergence or the entire divergence had been well within the tolerance now. So the uh, basically the uh, uh, the issues uh, which resulted in the divergence, most of them are like the, uh, uh, like the, uh, the technical reasons which could not be captured during the uh, regular uh, processes and all. And we have to strengthen the process further to ensure that such a type of things don't uh, repeat in the future. So you said the provision is going to be 40 crore, which is a yes. significant portion because I think you indicated your last year's annual profits were 70 crores. 700 crores. Oh, 700 crores. Last, like yeah, last year profit was 760 crores. But what could be and the after... actual provisions? Because you have managed to upgrade, uh, you know, already one-fourth of it. Another one-fourth will get upgraded in due course. What could be the actual net the, impact the, of the provisions? The, yeah, the exact number we will be in a position to declare along with our third quarter result, mm -hmm. ascertain the, ascertaining the latest stages of the individual accounts. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the outer limit is what we have uh, uh, spoken in terms of the total quantum and all. We have been, uh, uh, al already we have started seeing significant recoveries from the old NPAs. So the gap between the upgradation and uh, uh, the slippages is what we have to consider on an ongoing basis. And the uh, numbers, whatever that has come is, uh, uh, though it is unfortunate that it should not have come, uh, it is, uh, uh, we hope uh, it is well within our uh, uh, capacity to absorb that stock because of the uh, sufficient strength in the p and and balance. Because of this uh, issue, you do you think you may have to lower your guidance on other parameters? Uh, you know, you had earlier guided for a loan growth of about 15 to 18 percent for FY23. Uh, would you stick to that guidance or would you be under? Uh, we don't see any reason to uh, like say downgrade that and all as you, uh, uh, based on for this particular uh, uh, information. So we still feel that uh, year end we should be able to uh, close it to 15 to 18 percentage. And all along, after uh, like say, uh, December 2019, when we started feeling the, uh, uh, like say, the market is getting tighter, when we said that we are taking our legs off the growth pedal, subsequently we have focused on the, uh, like say, uh, uh, low risk or virtually zero risk to gold loans to go for the growth, uh, which uh, uh, basically, like say, the uh, having a, a very, very, very uh, low risk in their uh, portfolio so that the asset growth can happen without increasing the risk proportionally. 
so we don't uh, uh, feel uh, uh, like say any uh, downgrade or uh, reduction in the growth potential is needed uh, although and uh, we feel we have uh, we will be able to carry on uh, uh, those business parameters on that nevertheless there are uh, certain uh, uh, things particularly on the internal controls and uh, uh, policies and the practices which we have to do as pointed out by the inspection and all we will uh, 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 do it uh, uh, we take it very seriously and we will do that so that uh, such type of thing don't uh, repeat in the thing as i told you we had a similar uh, like the unfortunate incident about uh, six years back and it is happening after six years okay we we'll leave it at that mr kamakodi thanks a lot for joining in and good to know that uh, this is not uh, you know something that perhaps could affect your deposits could affect your loan growth uh, and thank you for sharing uh, the numbers with us as well anand tandon is also sitting by so let's get a quick comment from him anand any thoughts uh, city union bank is a stock that is a part of you know large portfolios uh, mutual funds etc uh, the stock has been under pressure what do you do now well first of all you know it's trading roughly about two times book value historic so that makes it reasonably cheap it's a company where if you really think that you know the broader market will do well and smaller companies will do reasonably well given the kind of growth that the indeed that the economy is likely to report uh, you know that's the place where they have the highest exposure and therefore you know the yields are usually higher uh, the question that you didn't ask is why was there a divergence not that uh, they found a divergence you know and uh, that would have been interesting to answer because you would assume that they are they have been in the sme space for so long that they should be over providing for whatever they know whenever the cycle gets tough so at this stage i would argue that you know city union bank is one of the better banks to be looking at assuming that there is no great stress that you likely to see in the economy Okay, well, uh, that was a question I asked. What led to the divergence? Maybe you missed that, but I guess sometimes you know managements choose not to answer as well, despite repeatedly asking them uh, these reasons. But uh, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, we will get to talking about technicals. Mitesh Thakkar and Kush Bora will join in for some technical trades. Stay tuned. Welcome back. There is a risk of sentiment this morning. The SJX Nifty is still down close to about half four percent following the weakness that we are seeing in U.S. markets overnight and Asia this morning. There are going to be two IPOs which list today. One is Landmark Cars. It's a premium car retailer, and the other one is a Barnes Holding. So there is going to be some action at 10 a.m. as well when these two companies make their debut on uh, the exchanges. But let's uh, welcome uh, Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sakani and Kush Bora of KushBora.com uh, to talk about the market setup and the. technical trades this morning uh, mitesh your thoughts you were indicating that perhaps if the nifty gets to levels of 18100 you would consider uh, some more short positions uh, tell us your view this morning uh, good morning i have been actually you know, maintaining some kind of a negative bias on the index for last few days selling on every rallies and 18100 was a critical level on a closing basis not today with the sx indicating a negative open we are likely to trade below that in the uh, Uh, opening phase, and I think you know if there's no recovery, and in case the market doesn't uh, make an effort to climb back above eighteen thousand one hundred one twenty levels, then I think we'll add on to short positions and go short in the futures as well. Till now, it was the options route, but I think today a uh, breakdown could could uh, suggest uh, taking us short in the future side as well. On the downside, looking at a seventeen nine seventy as the minimum target, but a good chance of seventeen eight fifty eight sixty zones uh, being tested are there on the uh, are are there on the chart. So I think that's the kind of view which I have. But a recovery above eighteen thousand one hundred, yes, you know, we will maintain our options position on the short side, but not around to the futures positions. Right, uh, Kush Bora of Kushbora dot com is also with us. Uh, Kush, what are what are your thoughts? Do you think the eighteen thousand level could be breached on the downside? And if yes, what is the order of the day? So sure, first up, Sonia, uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Well, uh, you know, let me start with a slightly broader view, which is, you know, I don't remember the last time when FIIs and DIIs were both buyers in the cash segment and the markets went down, right? and it's happened twice already uh, you know in this week in fact the entire net institutional you know activity for this week is actually positive and uh, you know by some margin so this tells me that you know the bulk of the selling that's happened is happened more in the derivative segment specifically in the index future segment so while the short term view uh, you know could be uh, you know negative uh, the medium term view is still intact 
18,000 is a psychologically important level. Plus, we've seen a bit of a put, uh, you know, build up on that. So I wouldn't be surprised if we test that. But that's where I would actually turn buyer. So as long as 17,800 on the Nifty and 41,500 is you know held on the bank Nifty, I would actually look for opportunities, you know, to buy. And you know, come budget and come next year, there is now a lot of room on the upside that's opened up for you know the indices to move higher. And on a lighter note, uh, you know, this is Santa's got a gift for the bears, right? Why should bulls have all the fun? <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, get in a few uh, trading ideas as well on individual names. Mitesh, what do you have for us? Uh, I have a mix of buy and sell calls today. Uh, on the buying side is uh, Jubilant Foods, uh, conditional buy if it starts getting past 536, then buy with a stop at 527 for targets of 555. Similarly, ICICI GI is also a conditional buy. On a breakout about 1246, buy with a stop at 1230 for a target of 1285. On the selling side is Adani Ports with a stop at 870 for targets of 830 and Godrej Properties uh, is a sell with a stop at 1240 for a target of 1200. All right. What about you, Kush? Uh, sure. I think, uh, you know, the metal sector is perhaps going to be the, you know, sector of 2023. So, you know, uh, I'm looking for buying opportunities in the entire metal space. Uh, despite the news coming out of uh, you know China, but as I said, on the long in the long run, uh, metal sectors seem to be you know setting up for and big out performance. So uh, Hindalco uh, would be my buy. We've seen a, a great bit of relative rel relative strength in the stock for the last couple of days. Uh, from from a trading perspective, 448 is where I would pl uh, place my stop loss, and my first target would be 470. Uh, secondly, banking sector. Now we've seen uh, you know a bit of a profit booking in this. But I think uh, some of these stocks are getting uh, to very attractive levels. Bank of Baroda being one of them. Here, uh, you know, my stop loss would be 170. My target would be 190. All right, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Those are individual trades and trade setups, uh, which uh, we are getting to you more coming up in a bit. Now, the Defence Acquisition Council has cleared the acquisition proposals worth of over 84,000 crore rupees with the with the uh, with procurement worth 82,000 crores to be completed through. Uh, local sources, uh, indigenous sources. Uh, <clears throat> acquisitions include the light, light tanks, naval anti-ship missiles, and offshore patrol vehicles. Amit Dikshit is analyst at ICS Securities. He's joining us now. I mean, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Just put in context this, uh, uh, you know, the, the clearance coming in from the government. Uh, how much of this number is known, uh, factored in into estimates for uh, listed companies? What is new? Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. So, uh, if you look at the numbers, first of all, 84,300 crores, and it is spread across various services, Navy, Air Force, as well as Indian Army, and Coast Guard as well. Uh, now, if you look at the genesis of this, I think it has to do with the uh, skirmishes on the northeastern border, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, this uh, has been uh, done in part. That has That is the driving factor. And uh, if you look at the uh, look at the individual, you know, uh, the category by while the detailed breakup is not available, and also the individual contract value at this stage is not available, as well as the timelines we don't have. But if you look at the individual items, so I believe that the uh, that it is uh, the, the naval anti-ship missiles, for instance, and uh, next generation offshore petrol vessels for Coast Guard. I think these were going around for a while. Uh, but uh, there are certain things like light tanks, for instance. Uh, now, in, in defense, what happens that unless and until you get, uh, there, there, there is always, you know, uh, an, uh, an anticipation of uh, certain orders flowing through. But unless until you have this acceptance of necessity, things uh, uh, really don't move. So uh, once we have this, so I believe people will start building these in their estimates. And particularly from an order book perspective, I think these will start gradually getting built in. However, uh, to answer your question, I think next generation offshore petrol vessels was definitely expected. Uh, similarly, uh, these uh, anti-ship missiles were expected and light tanks were expected, but nothing concrete was uh, announced earlier. So clearly it comes as a positive for the companies that are engaged in these. Okay, so let's talk about the stocks then because eventually that's what matters. Amit, what are your top stocks uh, from the defence space that you like where there is both growth potential and there's also valuation headroom because many of these stocks have been huge gainers in 2022? Yeah, so, yeah, so if you look at it from the uh, from the items that we have, I believe BDL, Bharat Dynamics, certainly stands uh, to gain because of the uh, focus on missile systems. Then if you talk about 
the high endurance uh, uh, you know uh, this one your long range guided bombs and uh, the missile integration so i believe solar uh, solar industries is uh, one company that can gain Uh, the next generation offshore petrol vessels were in line. I mean, were in talk by GRC for quite some time. Uh, and if you uh, look at the other, so, I mean, we uh, don't cover some of these talks directly. Some of the other analysts cover. Uh, for instance, uh, Bharat Forge, direct beneficiary of your uh, infantry combat vehicles, light tanks. LNT would benefit. So these are the stocks that would largely benefit. And of course, you know, from the surveillance system, the companies that are engaged in radar, like BEL, uh, would benefit. So these are the companies that would be direct beneficiaries. Of course, I mean, as I would add the disclaimer that we would wait for the details, uh, you know, before taking a really final final call on the stock. You know, pull up names like uh, now. I'm digressing a little bit, but uh, uh, intraday's for Cochin Shipyard completely smashed yesterday. Ten percent cut. Uh, let's have garden reach shipbuilders again. Uh, you know we saw a very large cut there. Uh, there you go. And uh, do you track these ones, Amit? Any thoughts? Uh, sorry, which one? Uh, garden uh, reach, Cochin, Mazgaon yeah, yeah. Dock, the shipbuilders. So, so as I said, you know, in case of shipbuilders, uh, we have a, a sell rating on shipbuilders. We don't cover Cochin shipyard, so uh, we cover Mazgaon, we cover Garden Reach. So uh, the sell rating is driven by the fact that you know we don't we see the peak uh, cash flow in FY25, and beyond that we don't have a great visibility on the execution part. So uh, uh, and if you look at from a stock perspective, these orders uh, I mean I look uh, I look at GRC that is Garden Reach being the primary beneficiary. Madgaon I don't think would benefit a lot from this, uh, and so will be coaching Shipyard, but definitely GRC could see some respite today. Okay, thanks a lot, Amit, for stopping by and speaking to us. That's on the defence sector. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, we'll have the pre-opening rates. We will talk about most stocks, so don't go anywhere. Vishal Manchanda of Systematics Group will talk about all the big pharma names on the back of rising COVID concerns and how you should approach them. Do stay tuned in.